You guys, welcome to episode number six of In the Bush podcast with myself, Cole Wilkes, and my brother, Joel Vanderloon. Morning, brother. Morning, man. Here we go again. (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited, dude. Um, You know what I was thinking is this is probably the best thing that anybody is going to have to look forward to on a Monday. (laughs) There isn't much to look forward to on a Monday. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I thought that was pretty cool. I was thinking about that the other day and I was like, you know what, you guys, we are here for you at the beginning of the week, every single week, every Monday. And thank you so much for listening. And if you're new to this podcast, we welcome you guys hit the follow button. We, we want you to be a part of our crew. And while you're at it, go ahead and leave us a five star review. Okay. Um, real quick, I want to get over a little, I want to get through a little bit of housekeeping stuff. This episode is brought to you by Joel and I's websites, which is bushsurvivaltraining.com. You guys can go there, $25 survival class. I think it's probably one of the cheapest ones out there on the internet, Joel, that people can go um, to go get into. And I just want to, you know, you guys are helping us out here. You guys like what we were doing, and we want to share everything that we do so you can follow along. Um, on our Instagrams and stuff like that. Also, my website is learnhuntharvest.com. Um, you can go there. I do in-person Zoom meetings um, and, and kind of uh, consultate you through a one-on-one class if you're not into the group setting and stuff like that. Um, you can also follow us on our Instagrams. I am Cole Wilkes Hunter on Instagram. Cole is, or Cole, Joel is Joel V. Bushcraft on Instagram, as well as In the Bush Podcast. You guys make sure you're following all of those. Um, real quick, I got something super exciting, Joel. I This is new that we're going to start doing, and I want to start shouting out all of the places that people listen from, okay? So, the, yeah, the past five days... I'm going to gather the top five listening cities in the top five listening countries. So if you guys want your city to be in the top listening cities of the week, you need to tell your friends about the podcast and spread the word in your neighborhood and get us as many listens as you possibly can. And you know what? Joel and I might start throwing out something. If you are in one of those top listening cities and you leave us a review or something, we might get something special going for you. Uh, we're we're going to have to we're going to have to brainstorm on that. Um, so yeah, we're on getting some giveaways for listeners for sure yes yes because we are actually working on partnering with some companies and that's in the works and we're so excited to announce that for us being a brand new podcast i think this is just so huge to give thanks where it's due and you guys doing all the listening is really what is helping us push this forward right joel Absolutely. And you know, those five star, re- those reviews, man, that it really kicks up our ranking on the podcast platform. Uh, looking at the statistics, most people are either listening on to a- Apple podcasts or through uh, Spotify. And you know, the, it really helps us uh, be found easier, you know, by increasing our ranking on those on those platforms. So you, you definitely are helping us in a big way by leaving us those reviews. Yeah. Yeah. And if you leave us a review, make sure you leave us your name and what city you are from, because we are probably going to start shouting you out as well and maybe picking one of those reviews a week and possibly giving you a cool prize. Um, Okay. Top listening cities, Joel, the top five in our nation. Okay. You ready for this? I I bet you can't even, can you get, you want to throw a guess? You want to throw a guess? And I'm going to say, ah. I'm going to go with a state in the Pacific Northwest. Okay. You, you're you're very good. Okay. So I'm going to be honest with you. Texas was ruling the roost for a while. But <laughs> Oregon has st- has really stepped up this past week. And our, our number one t- – or should I do it last? Let's do last. Okay. The, t- the okay. five – okay. Number five for this week is Colorado Springs, Colorado is oh, number five. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Number f- hunting. 
number four, we're gonna make we're gonna have to make sure we don't step over each other, Joel, because we are going through our phones. So if I'm talking, it's actually not it's it doesn't have any of your audio showing up here. Um, so just make sure that we uh, we don't step over each other. Number four in the top five is Seattle, Washington. That's crazy. <laughs> Thank you, Seattle. Yeah. Not too far. Time. Number three, right in the middle of everybody, is my hometown where I grew up here in Austin, Texas. That's awesome. The next one blows my mind, Joel. Portland, Oregon, coming in at number two of our top five listening cities. <laughs> and. Uh. And number one, this week's top listening city for the past five days is leading us, Bend, Oregon. Oh, yeah. The, the hometown. The hometown brings it. Oh, man, that's fantastic. I didn't I, I didn't know that. Thanks yeah. for mentioning that. I didn't yeah. look at the stats. Yeah, dude. I think the past five days we've had almost thirty listens just come out of out of Bend. Um, oh, that's yeah. Last week it was actually Austin, Texas. Um, I think we had around twenty five or so, something like that. But you guys, this is going to be a new little segment we're going to add in there each week just to give thanks to the places that are um, you know that are giving us all this support. Um, now, I do want to reach. I do want to tell everybody. I'm going to tell you the top five listening countries in the world joel do you know that in the bush podcast is being listened to over 14 different countries worldwide wow that's pretty impressive that's pretty good pretty good man yeah it's uh it's interesting i have to wonder how how the word spreads to these other countries but uh that we will never know well whenever you're worldwide celebrities like ourselves brother people just want to be a part of the group uh yeah, that's the funniest thing I've heard all morning. Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> the top five. Obviously, the USA, the United States of America is number one. It, it has something crazy like 400 and something downloads in the United States just in the past 30 days. And we've only been open for 30 days. Um, or our podcast has only been live for that amount of time. Um, so the the top five under the United States comes in. Number one is Australia. Number one is mm. Australia. Number two, mm. Canada. Number three is Indonesia. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Number four is the United Kingdom. And com huh. coming in at number five this week is Slovenia. <laughs> oh, wow. That's unexpected. Man. Well, that's that's very humbling. Like to think about all these people and you know different cultures, different languages, and you know listening to us talk. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, well, let's hope we don't disappoint with this one, then, Cole. Yeah, I hope not. So, let's get into it, Joel. We're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to do this is the second part of our shelters um, podcast, and this week, y'all, I think we're going to be talking about more of a long term shelter. Um, and we're going to talk about synthetic materials that we might use in situations like our hunting or our backpacking um, or hiking, stuff like that. So, Joel, I'm going to start us off with the with our music, and then we're going to dive right into this episode. Yeah, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to In the Bush Podcast with Cole and Joel. Oh. I, that music takes me to so many places every time. I you know, know, it just takes me back there with the Hudza in Africa. It takes me into the Elkwoods with you. It's just, uh, it's beautiful. I love it. Well, my man, uh, here we go, bro. We're gonna we're gonna continue. On our shelter discussion, we felt like that that first episode we wanted to cover more, and we couldn't. I had to I had to run. Our time was cut a bit short, so we're going to continue with that. And this could um, we're sort of going to just 
we don't have a, a major plan in the direction we're going to go with this. So we're just going to talk and just it's going to all be free flowing and organic. But where I did want to start was there's a couple things I just wanted to f finish off with our um, shelter discussion uh, on part one. And that is that applies to long term shelters or short term shelters. Um, and that would be utilizing a fire with your shelter. Um, we're going to definitely be doing a whole episode or two on fire. So I'm not going to delve into the actual fire making aspect of it, but I do want to talk about the advantages of having a fire with your shelter. Obviously, the advantages are that you're going to be so much warmer than just relying on a shelter alone. However, things that are really important to mention, and I'm always wanting to mention things that uh, are not that are kind of overlooked or really not highlighted enough. And one of those things is that when you build your fire outside of a shelter or when you build your, your fire inside of a shelter, there's a couple of different things to consider. Building a fire outside the shelter, there's a lot less to worry about. When I say outside your shelter, whether you have an A-frame or a lean-to, wherever your door is facing is where you're going to be building your shelter. You do not want that fire too close to your shelter entrance to where it could be hazardous getting in and out of your shelter. Also, if your fire gets a little bit too big, it actually could put too much heat into that shelter and make it really uncomfortable. But most importantly is you never want anything over your fire. You want to, unless you are going to actually build a rock hearth, a rock or clay hearth, something that actually can handle quite a high heat load without uh, combusting, without igniting. Um, you really want to steer clear from putting a shelter underneath any sort of debris or wood that over time your fire will dry out significantly and then sort of it'll spontaneously combust because of the heat buildup in that, in that material. Um, and this has led to people's shelters burning down. I've experienced uh, participants on courses I've run, um, and I've, I've definitely know people on alone that have burnt down their shelters uh, because of this reason. It's a little bit overlooked. Uh, oftentimes, you think that, you know, it's high enough, it will not burn. But over time, like I said, it just gets so dry that, that it can ignite. And I'm talking about mostly whatever insulation material you're using, pine needles, you know, that sort of thing. Um, the, the other thing, too, is that on really cold nights, if you're relying on a, sh on a fire, you might want to get more heat out of that fire. So you kind of start stacking on wood, stacking on wood. And next thing you know, that flame keeps creeping higher and higher until it captures your, your shelter alight. So with that being said, keep that fire a reasonable distance away from your shelter. Um, the, the, the inside of a shelter is a whole different ball game. Now we're delving into long-term survival shelter. I don't see building a fire in a short-term survival shelter as being practical. And the biggest issue that you're going to have with that is going to be smoke inside the shelter. That is honestly one of the most challenging things about building a fire inside of a long-term shelter. If you are going to just be building a fire pit inside of your shelter and try to maintain a fire without getting smoked out, you're going to have to have outside air allowed to come into your shelter. You're also going to have to have somewhere on the highest point of the shelter, somewhere where that smoke can vent out. Now, there's kind of pros and cons to this, right? It's nice that you get that extra warmth, but you do have to let cold air into your shelter and you do have to, you know, have a vent going out. So this, this creates more openings in your shelter. So it's, it is more ideal to actually build a fireplace, an actual hearth, and then you vent your smoke outside. Um, on season seven of Alone, I managed to find a bunch of old rusty tin cans. I cut out the bottoms. I pushed each can into each other and actually created a flue pipe coming out of my shelter to vent that smoke. But without that, without having an actual uh, um, exhaust system like that, you really want to build your fire hearth actually on the outside of your shelter. So if, so if you think about the back wall of your shelter, where whatever that's going to look like, you're going to build a little box style hearth on the outside of the shelter so that the front part of your fire is level with 
your with the wall of your shelter. And that way, your smoke will automatically vent outside of the shelter. I hope that that makes sense. Um, you know, can you, do you think I'm explaining that okay, Cole? Is that? Yeah, I think you're doing great there. I, I do want to step back just a little bit and and understand that the fire in the fire with the shelter is a it's a very double edged sword. Okay, you guys really need to be paying attention and being cautious of of your fire. Okay, because I think this is the number one destructor of shelters is people getting complacent with their with their fire. Um, most of the times when you see a shelter fail, it's because they've been, they've just been too complacent and, and didn't take the precautions they needed to with their fire. Um, we, we've seen it on, on both shows on really, I've seen it, um, in, in places where we're just screwing around and somebody screws around and, and makes too big of a fire or they place their fire improperly inside their shelter. So just keep that in mind. Um, it, as the days go on that your shelter is there, all of that debris is becoming a, a, a tinder bundle, you know, so you have to keep that in mind, um, at all times and, 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 you know, be careful. Absolutely. The ways to do that is, is really to have some sort of insulative, um, material that surrounds your fire. So, big flat um you know shale or granite rocks something like that that you can line the fireplace with so that if embers jump out of the fire that's another big thing too right is embers so w wood that has moisture in it uh tends the moisture will expand as the wood he heats up especially if the bark is on this is typically where you'll see it on a lot of like spruce and fir trees is the the moisture will expand the bark pieces of bark will pop off and as they pop off, those will obviously have embers. They'll pop off onto your uh, into your shelter. So whether that goes on your clothing or into some leaves or something, that is a fire hazard too. So if you can keep your fire enclosed, it's going to be so much safer. And to me, a long-term shelter, which we're going to get into, uh, a, a, a fi an actual fireplace just is synonymous with a long-term shelter. I, it, it, they just hand in hand. So um, – the best way to build that hearth is a ton of videos online that you can look up. And of course, anyone who's watched alone, you'll see a lot of those being built, um, is using rocks primarily, but incorporating rocks and mud or rocks and clay, um, you can really build a, a really nice sealed hearth. Um, but like I said, this whole firebox, if you will, is on, actually on the exterior side of the shelter but it joins into the shelter so that you can actually feed things into the fire. All the heat gets pushed into the shelter, but the actual smoke is raising out of that box, out of the shelter. I don't think I can explain that a better way, but that building one of those is a, is a whole different topic on its own. I just wanted to at least um, just point out the fact that fires are hazardous. You definitely don't want to be smoked out of your shelter. Um, that will severely affect your um, your 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 health. I know Kai on my season season seven of Alone had a very, had a lot of smoke issues with her shelter and really had a lot of respiratory issues um, for a little bit before she recovered there. So yeah, so think about that. Don't burn your shelter down. Don't have those embers popping all around your shelter and try not to have a smoky shelter. So yeah, I mean that was pretty much the first thing I wanted to mention, Cole. And now we're gonna we're gonna move into so I guess talk long-term long-term shelters and how to build them so real quick i want to give you my idea what i was thinking about if i was to go on alone i wasn't I, my my fire shell or my fire pit i was thinking i was going to use rock and cob um i love the idea of cob is because it's very easy for people to be able to make a decent um a decent a decent hearth with but I had an idea of I wanted to run my flue underneath my bed and then up and out the other side. Does that make sense? Like to where I would almost be laying on a cob bed that my flue actually went under, almost like a earth fire well, bed. Yeah, you're you're sort of delving into what they what we call a Dakota fire pit. Okay. Where you actually have to have your fire below ground level so you'd have to dig a hole have it so that the heat obviously the coming off the fire is at floor level so that you can actually capture that heat and funnel it underneath you and out and i've actually seen that being done and man in a cold environment what an awesome thing 
Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Your bed heated. I mean, we did we talk about beds? I, I actually, sorry guys, I don't know if we talked about bedding in the last episode, but the ground will always pull the heat out of your body. So you have to be insulated off the ground. You, whether that's using a bunch of fur boughs, pine needles, whatever it is, you need to create a significant amount of insulation between your body and the ground. A- another way to do it is heat the ground, like Cole's saying. It's yeah. a really good idea to keep that ground warm. You can also put hot rocks in the fire, and you can bury those hot rocks underneath you. There's, there's a, a variety of ways. But bottom line is you do not want to be touching the cold ground unless you are heating that ground up. Yeah. Well, and to my idea, it was just going to be a radiant heat. It wasn't going to be something I had to stick my hands directly over the flame. It was going to be something that was just going to be permeating a little bit of heat the whole time, right? I can stoke it up. I can build a big fire over there. It's fluing through the Dakota fire hole and then up and out of my shelter. Um, And there's many different ways that you can, you can create that, uh, that little situation. But that was just kind of my idea. I was thinking we're going to have so much time. And that was one of the things that I really wanted to concentrate on was making sure that during the night, it was going to be, you know, even after my fire would have went out that that earth mass would have actually been holding quite a bit of heat throughout the night and keep me from maybe having to wake up so often. Absolutely, man. And if you think about it, if you can heat the ground up enough to where you have to burn a fire all night, that's that's really a, that's a huge benefit. Yeah. Um, you know, when I think about long term, I mean, what do you with construction, Cole? When I think about long term survival shelter, I do always think about a frame. Me personally, I'm just kind of like looking at either a stereotypical square to box shaped cabin with a v pitched roof like pretty pretty stereotypical i'm like i said last episode i'm super simple i don't get fancy the the way that i would look at building any long-term shelter is i I want to erect some walls whether i'm going to dig into the ground to create those that more of a thermal regulated shelter and also save on how much wood I'm going to need to build my walls higher by actually building my shelter a little deeper, or if I'm just going to build straight up the ground. Either way, I'm going to want to put some walls up that that well, my roof will come off of. So for me, the two ways of doing those walls, regardless if I want them six foot high or just four, three or four foot high, is I'm either going to go with Lincoln log style walls, or I'm going to go with two vertical supports so stakes in the ground which you can actually place big logs in between and build up off of each other so stack them up and those stakes on either end of those logs are what keep those um the walls strong and vertical and you know the lincoln log style i think is is pretty pretty famous most people know it you kids you you can buy lincoln log toys uh, wood wood collections you can build yourself and you know dick prunica who uh Mm -hmm. first you you know dick prunica out in alaska his videos are just uh, spectacular he's an old timer that went up into alaska in the remote parts and built himself these cabins and he did it lincoln log style now lincoln log style is very very simple but very time consuming so I think for any of these long-term shelters, all we really need is a good axe, a good saw. And of course, adding on there, you can have a little bit of extras, like you could have a shovel, you could have maybe a, uh, a draw knife, you know, to remove bark. Um, that's, that's those, that would be really helpful. So removing bark, I'm just going to jump on that quickly before I talk about Lincoln log style. Removing bark is pretty crucial for a long-term shelter because how wood rots is moisture gets trapped between the actual wood and the bark. So if you um, if you remove the bark, it actually will not hold any of that moisture. It'll be able to breathe. And so if you, in a long-term survival situation, you definitely want to remove the bark. In a short-term survival situation, no big deal. So getting to Lincoln Log, the way that Lincoln Logs work is literally going to be building a, square sh- a square-shaped um, uh, cabin you're going to notch each end of your logs into a V-notch. And then the two logs go on the ground in one position, so they're parallel to each other, and that creates the sort of the width of your your cabin. The next two are going to go 90 degrees on top of those. And you're also going to V-notch them to about half the depth of the log. That way, 
you're kind of like puzzle pieces, right? You, you're fitting these logs into one another. And because you're doing these V-notches, which go to about half of the, the thickness or half the diameter of the log, when you place the one log on top of the other, they actually are flush with each other. And they need to be flush with each other. If they're not, you're going to have these big gaps where you lay these logs uh, over each other. If you keep just stacking in that way, then you're basically going to build up some solid walls that support each other really, really strong. But it is tedious because you have to make those notches um, the perfect depth and width so that these logs fit into each other without the gaps in between. You're still going to have some small gaps. That's pretty normal. It's hard to eliminate all gaps. Um, and with those gaps, just because of the irregularities in the in the logs and a couple knots here and there. Um, and you can use things like clay, I would say, would be ideal. Mud, moss. You can use whatever you've got at hand to chink, which is going to be basically closing up the gaps. So the best way to chink is going to be once you've you've got your one log on the ground, you're going to lay the other one on top, is to then lay a layer of whatever material you're going to chink with on top of that log. Then you lay the log on top of that and kind of sandwich it in. That's often very difficult to do um, because you have to do it sort of quickly and it, it's hard to, to not spill it off. So a lot of people are going to chink afterwards. Yeah. And what, if you're doing it afterwards, you're just going to need just like a little baton, like a mallet, and then you can just fashion a little uh, like chisel, which you can just carve out of a, a stick and you can just sort of hammer whatever the medium is in there um, to close up all those gaps. So you, it's, I'm trying to keep it very simple, but Lincoln Log, you can like the best thing I can always say is you can YouTube a lot of this stuff to see the actual mechanics of how they're made. But I want to open up those people who haven't heard of this method to 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 look into it because it's a very effective way to to build a long-term survival. When I say long-term survival shelter, this is actually this is actually a log cabin, Cole. It's yeah. like more of a cabin that way, right? Yeah. I mean, you're talking about financial logs, weigh a lot, a lot of manpower, a lot of time. Like this is a significant investment into the shelter. The other method I'm going to finish off with is, which I mentioned earlier, is you're going to decide where your walls are going to be. That's where you're going to pile up your logs. But to hold those logs in place, because they're literally just going to be sitting on top of each other, you're going to have two major stakes in the ground on one end of that log and then two major stakes on the other end of that log. Those are going to, You're either going to have to, depending on the kind of weight that you're going to be dealing with, you might have to dig holes in the ground to support those stakes. Those stakes have to be really secure. So you're going to have to get a big mallet and you're going to have to hammer these things into the ground. So you've basically got these two stakes on either end and you're just picking up logs and piling them in between those and they automatically will keep all the logs uh, held up vertically. Once you're done, usually what you have to do is get some sort of cordage material and you tie those stakes together at the top and you tie them as tight as you can so that they kind of clamp all of those logs in place. And you will do that on whichever sides you're going to build a wall. And it's a pretty easy way because you don't have to notch, right? Like a Lincoln log style takes a lot of time to, to notch. But with this, you don't have to log, uh, don't have to notch. So either way, that's that's how I would look at building my walls, you know, for a, for a, for a long-term shelter. Anything that you would uh, add to that, Cole? Yeah, so I, I had a little di little bit different idea. I think the the main, you know, shelter as far as it being a an A-frame or a lean-to um, I would basically call mine like a modified lean to. So I'm going to be building the walls like what you're saying, Joel, but I'm only going to stick in like a single pitch just for, sim okay. just for simplicity. It's going to be 45 degrees or plus, but it's going to have enough room underneath that, um, for me to be able to move around and be comfortable in my little shelter. Now my walls, um, what, I don't know the, the exact term Joel that it is, but whenever you basically stick a and it doesn't have to be a giant stick but you're basically sticking sticks about every foot to 18 inches and then you're weaving in small debris in between that okay yeah so this is a lot this is a great shelter for some of the women that aren't going to be dragging giant 150 pound logs around um this is something yeah. that anybody even kids love to build this type of shelter because it's real simple. You just get to weaving, and whenever your stick ends, just go back with the next stick and overlap that one, uh, 
you know, one of your supports and then continue on with your weaving. Now, this is a time-consuming process, but I like to take, this was just my, my thought, if I could have found some mud, some thatch, you know, mix together, make that cob or the clay to be able to pack into those walls to get that air tightness, just like what Joel was talking about with chinking, um, it's just a different style and basically you're, you're, it's, I think it's even more windproof, um, but it's a lot more time consuming. And I mean, really it's kind of, it's, and it is kind of material specific too. Yes. Because, be, because of the area. Yeah. You do need to have like long, longer, uh, thinner when I say thinner, like maybe an inch diameter maximum, cause you, it, it has to be supple enough for you to do that over and under weaving. Yes. Um, certain areas, if you have access to like riparian areas with older thickets, like older, you know, they, they grow in these little thickets and they don't, they, you can get a number of them that are within that size range. Um, this would be a, an awesome shelter and talk about strong call mm. that the shelter. Once you weave that thing together, it is not going anywhere. And um, what's really cool is you could take that same technique that you do for the walls, y'all. Me and Joel have actually built one of these out in Florida where you just weave, weave, weave. And I'm talking, we put, we, we used vines is what we did. And then we took our insulate, yeah, our insulation and stacked it up on top um, to be able to, to have our shingling. Um, so it's, it's actually a really cool and, and quick way if you have those types of materials. Now, if you're in the Arctic, that might not necessarily be the case. <laughs> uh, no, I think, I think, you know, shelters, um, which I did talk about in part one, shelters really are dictated so much by the environment. And this is where you can't really separate yourself from the environment with your own ideas and how you want to enforce those ideas on the environment. The environment is going to influence your ideas. It always has to be that way. If you're in a desert environment, you've got very few options for vegetation. But, hey, a lot of the areas are going to have quite a lot of options for rocks. So you're going to have to incorporate rocks into your shelter. So you really just have to rely on the environment. But the, the beauty of what we're talking about is the, one, what, the way I described building my walls and the way Cole described building his walls are completely different which is exactly the point is that the more tools you have in your tool bag the more ability you have to adapt in any environment if you want to build a shelter there and the list really does go on and on with the different types of shelters and how you can approach them long term but you know the the important thing too is um is to also like understand your physical limit and your skill level like I think that you're definitely putting an A-frame roof is more complicated than just having a lean-to style roof. So Cole's idea of the lean-to style roof, uh, which I forgot to mention, when I, if I was going to go with the Lincoln Log style build, I would absolutely just go with uh, the single pitch roof because I can structure my logs in a way that once my walls are done, all I have to do is just get a bunch of logs to lie vertically, or sorry, horizontally on top of my structure, all the way from top to bottom, and I've got my roof. That's it. Whereas an A-frame obviously is more complicated to make, it's, it's higher, and it's also harder to make strong. Um, so th there's definitely uh, different ways to approach this all, but at the end of the day, it's, we've got to remember, it needs to be strong, it needs to be able to shed moisture, uh, but more so in a long-term survival shelter, I think what we're really looking for is that durability aspect. You want it to last a long time, but more so than that, you really want more of, of a, a insulative aspect to it. And that's uh, so. So your shelter that you mentioned, Cole, you could double up those walls. So you know how like you're weaving your walls. What you would do is you would just maybe a foot or two in or outward of those walls, you make another one. Then what you do is you have this one to two feet gap between those. You just start piling any kind of debris in there to create your insulated walls. And hugely effective. I mean, that, that's a, such an incredible way to insulate a shelter. Yeah. Um, all of this is time consuming. Any long-term shelter is going to take weeks to months 
to to build um but a really really fun project yeah um the thing i like about the the thing i like about the the lean to um roof is like shell and i whenever we were in africa we fastened that roof up pretty quick and then if we had to we could we had something we could get in and get out of the ring even though we didn't have any walls and then those walls we could have easily put up or been constructed the the next several days in advance um that's one Uh, thing i like uh, about it a hundred percent so it's funny yeah it's funny you mentioned that because my strategy on alone with my shelter was to not have a a a uh rough shelter to live in for a little while while i build my palace you know right next to it no i wanted to i wanted to make sure that i was using my calories efficiently so from day one i started building I, this this is where the a-frame kind of shines through for me as a sort of intermediate like when i say long term would i have lived it in for years probably not but it was good for several months um was if i erect a substantial a-frame i can then string a top over it and i have a roof then all the walls i can get back to making those uh as the days go on so so it's it's a work in progress but from day one but eventually it's going to be a a finished shelter and none of the work that i put into it is going to be wasted or have to be broken down or abandoned and so that is kind of where what i like about that um the uh i think that the, the idea of having a little quick live-in shelter and then building another monster shelter nearby is definitely something to think long and hard about when it comes to calories. Because, I mean, if you're doing a long-term shelter, you're doing this well-fed, right? You're not building a long-term shelter on, on eating a handful of food a day. So that just doesn't add up. You know, you can't – that the, the calories in and the calories out just do not balance out. So just keep that in mind. Well, so um, let's let's dive into that for just a second. I, and I'm, you know, I think this is where a lot of people make huge mistakes, Joel. A lot of people, and we see it time and time again. Somebody either screws up because they didn't pay attention to their location, and then they come to find out five days later that they've been constructing this badass shelter, and they have it pointed in the wrong direction, or they don't have any natural cover or something about it. They don't like, and then they're going to pick up and move. Like, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, well, like a long-term shelter, you need to be very um, sure on on the location. You know, like you have to think about things long-term, like like wind direction, but you got to think about, okay, well, when the low-pressure systems come through and you have storms, then which direction is it coming through? Yeah. You know, and you think about the potential of flooding, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot you want to think about there. And we talked a lot about that in the, in the first part of this. Yeah. Um, so let's get to the roofs. Okay. So if you are going to go totally primitive, of course, there's a variety of ways to do it, but you're going to have to create waterproofing, whether that is with, and I'm just jumping on things that I've already said in the, in the first part, we're going to use either bark shingling. We're going to use a lot of wood as logs, which just really isn't practical for a roof to put that much weight on your shelter. So you're really going to gravitate more to what um, what you have in your environment, which could be bark shingles. It could be moss, you know, like sphagnum moss grows on the ground in, in all of those northern latitudes, you know, Alaska, you know, up to Canada, all that sort of area. And you can peel it off the floor. You can actually, you know, kind of get your hands under and, and work the roots free and peel it off in layers like turf. And you can lay that on your roof. And that stuff absorbs a lot of moisture. Is it completely waterproof? Not really, but it absorbs a lot of moisture, which is great. It saps it up, um, you know, when it does rain on top of the shelter. If you're in, a, in an environment that gets a lot of rain, then you might have to go an extra step and, and do incorporate different layers. So maybe bark and moss, um, clay, you know, cob, like Cole was saying, is even better. So the difference between clay and cob is that Cob is almost like, think about cement, right? Like when you make cement, you have your cement powder, you've got aggregate, you mix water. Like you have to have binding agents to keep it together so it doesn't just crack and crumble. It makes it stronger. So cob, you're utilizing any sort of fibrous material for the sort of binder to keep it all together. 
you're using some sort of aggregate, um, which could be very small, small rocks, things that are ground up like that to add a bit of strength. And then, of course, you have your clay. So you add those all together, and when it dries, it's just so much stronger. If you use clay on its own, when it dries, it tends to just crack. It's very brittle. So using that, those sort of materials are, are great for roofing. But I think the direction we wanted to go into a little bit more here is utilizing some man-made materials. So tarps. You know, tarps are just kind of synonymous with long-term survival, and they're absolutely a game changer. And although... I am definitely very inspired by our native ancestors and doing things the primitive way. I'm not going to argue with what a difference having a waterproof tarp makes. <laughs> it's just incredible. So there's the tarps. I mean, I think it's uh, polypropylene, I think, is the one is the most common material. You know, it's that really kind of noisy, uh, but very waterproof, lightweight material. Um, tarps come in all sort of different sizes, and you can go from cheap to expensive. Um, they also come in canvas, so it's wax canvas, which I really like, but they're really heavy. And if in a really rainy environment where you're consistently getting rainfall, eventually it's going to start seeping water through, whereas that polypropylene will not. So the trick with the tops really is to secure them on your shelter in a way that they are, are really stretched out tightly without any sharp points underneath to rip them. And you really don't want to let any air funnel underneath the top, sort of blowing it up because it causes a lot of strain on the top. So each top has a bunch of eyes or cringles, whatever you call them, where you can secure the top with some string. So you are going to need string with tarp unless you want to just use the tarp by, by weighting it down with logs or something like that. But um, you, you want to be able to secure that top around your shelter in a way that each one of those eyes has got some string and it's really clamped down tight, really tight. Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, you don't want your top flapping. That's going to rip. But second of all, well, I hate the noise of a flapping top. I don't know what it is. It is like someone running their nails down a chalkboard. I, I just, I can't handle it. Like, there's no ways I'm going to sleep with that sound. of it. Well, no. to me, it shows that your tarp is set up improperly yeah yeah so yeah. if you're getting a bunch of noise and stuff like that like i it's something somewhere needs to be tightened or you know a lot of times there's not an eye there joel so a lot of times i'll take a small like half inch pebble and stuff it into my tarp and then wrap some string and tie to that and then retie so that piece does not flap around or, or so on and so forth um yeah, yeah. Any, that's a great Rick, if you don't have eyes or your eyes break, is as you say, get a little like um, what would be the like a grape size pebble yes. or some acorn, a piece of bark, whatever, and then wrap the top, squeeze the top around that, and then just tie a little cinch knot on there, and then yep. you're good to go again. Yep. Yeah. I've done it many times because of that exact reason. Because somewhere in between my tie downs, I don't have something pulled exactly. You know geometry wise it's not pulling right and it's flapping in one area or the other yeah and and so just to jump i think talking about tops in the long term you know using it as a roof i don't think that there is a ton of depth to go into however i would like to talk about and i really want you to talk about this is um using a top as just a camping shelter a just a shelter that you're going to take with you wherever you're going to go and you're actually going to plan to sleep under it and you know, you and I are huge fans of tarps, and when every time we've gone camping together, we're always utilizing tarps. I have that sort of hexagonal uh, type tarp, which I can string up on top of a hammock, or I can I, I usually just um, string it up into somewhat of a lean-to style roof that I sleep under in the back country. It only weighs a little less than a pound. It's just so practical. It is a lightweight tarp, so it's nylon and it's lightweight, easy to carry, but pretty durable. But ever since we have camped together, whether it be Florida, Texas, um, in, you know, Idaho, uh, Oregon, like you, you have always used your hammock and tarp sleep system. And I must say, you have got it down yeah. with the way that. You up. So I'd like you to talk about that hammock and tarp camping setup, the, the sort of pros and cons of how to do it. 
Yeah, man. Um, so I, I hunt a lot of nasty backcountry country, um, no matter what or where I am, whether that be in the swamps of Florida, whether that be in the peaks of Colorado, whether that be in, in out there in the jungles of, of Oregon with Joel chasing, chasing elk, uh, out West. Um, the, in my opinion, the best backpacking, the best backcountry setup is a tarp in a hammock. And people are like, oh, well, what are you going to do whenever it snows or whenever the weather's real bad? Well, let me tell you, I've been through it. I've been through it in, in, I, Kyle and I were trapped one time in a storm and uh, we were, we were elk hunting. And it was one of those situations where we're like, hey, man, it's going to come and be here before we can make it back to the truck. So we might as well just batten down the hatches and get ready for it. It snowed. Mm over 12 inches in a four day period. It didn't stop snowing. And, uh, and yeah, the tarp did amazing. Now it wasn't set up the way it would be if it was just nice and beautiful weather. No, I had it backed up, up against a tree to where if you can picture the a frame, right? You have, you have this a, so the a portion of the, of the tarp was backed up all the way up against a tree to where it actually kind of my ridge was tied directly to the tree and then my points that go down to make the feet of the a were were drove into the ground and then i covered up okay and then i covered up the edges of the feet of the a with dirt so there was no way that my tarp could flap and get a drift underneath it the only thing Mm. that was open was at the very front of my a frame okay that's where i climbed in and out and I actually laid right there on the ground on that setup. So, oh, you oh, you went on the ground. I yeah. did, but I'm getting to something, okay? We had two different setups. Kyle didn't like the idea of being on the ground. Um, I, I was going for the more, because uh, I really thought we were going to get some mega wind throughout this four-day period of storm. And um, it wasn't too bad, but it did drift some. Now, Kyle... He, he stayed in his hammock setup, and what he did is he just brought his A-frame in closer to his hammock to really get that steep, and he took it all the way to the ground, as close to the ground as he possibly could to keep any yeah. wind drift, okay? Now, when you guys are camping with, with a tarp in a backcountry setting like that and it's cold, there's two different things that you have to have in your hammock setup, okay? You have to have either a sleeping pad – or you have to have a under quilt that goes underneath your quilt that basically builds, it's an insulation area or a insulation uh, between your body in the hammock and the outside air, okay? If you mm. don't have anything protecting your body, because think about it, if you just get in a sleeping bag and you climb into a hammock, just like on the ground, it's going to compress that insulation of your sleeping bag underneath you, and then the wind is going to get right to your skin. I've had it happen. I have froze to death whenever I first started this, okay? So hammock, yeah. hammocks can put you in a bad situation if you're not geared up properly. But what I will say is, is you as long as there are trees, you can set up a hammock absolutely anywhere. That's what I love about it, okay? A lot yeah, of, that's the beauty. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the guys that I've backcountry hunted with that has to set up a tent, we've got to walk around for a while to find somewhere flat and easy for them to set up where I can hang, as long as I have trees that are going from the ground out somewhere, I can hang my hammock up on a 20 degree uh, slope. It doesn't matter because it's, it's, it's hanging, right? I don't, it doesn't matter. I can set my tarp up accordingly and one side might be, you know, the ground might be right there, but it's so steep. It just falls out from underneath me. Well, guess what? I'm comfortable and I'm in my hammock and I have everything that I need, sleeping bag, sleeping pad, uh, under quilt. And, uh, it really makes it versatile. So same thing with like the swamp, Joel, we, we literally, I had my hammock set up. I could have set up in the water and been sleeping dry. You could not have done that. Right. Yeah. It's why I did. I had my hammock. If you recall that situation, well, the one in Florida, I had my hammock, but I didn't have an insulative pad. Mm, that's right. 
cold that one night. And so I was supposed to stay on the ground, which I stayed on the ground and I did exactly. I've also learned that you have a super steep pitch of your shelter, of your, of your top, run it all the way to the ground and kind of wedge yourself in there. And I was so much warmer. But if I had have had that insulative pad, or that quilt, as you mentioned, to 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 shield, to insulate me from the outside air, it would have been a game changer. But I didn't have yeah. one, so that was my my, my lesson hard learned. You guys, <laughs> y'all can go back on Flatlander, and Joel might have some. I, I don't know if you posted videos of that trip or not, um, but yeah, I yeah. I do have. Uh, man, that was a long time ago, dude. That was. We should go back to Florida sometime, Joel. <laughs> we should take a group with us too man let's do yeah, it we should. let's do it if you guys yeah. are interested in taking a survival course in florida uh you guys hit us up we've got five spots available 1200 bucks <laughs> <laughs> yeah we uh we definitely had a great time out there there's a lot of fish to catch there's there's edibles to forage um yeah it's a it's a great place to go and have a little survival challenge and i've done it several times and absolutely had a blast each time um the uh, the one other thing i want to throw in there which is which is applicable <laughs> to of tropical environment or uh, not even tropical or marshy or anything, but up in uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, up in the mountains in summer, we have a lot of mosquitoes, a lot. So if you are dealing with any of those kind of environments that have bugs, then the beautiful thing about a hammock is that you can actually have mosquito nets incorporated in your hammocks too. So don't think like, oh, well, what about a buggy environment? Then I have to have a tent. Well, you don't have to have a tent because you can actually buy hammocks that have uh, mosquito nets incorporated. So you can sleep in there bug free. And the beautiful thing about that in any of these marshy areas, like Cole said, is you stay off the ground. So you, you're going to be comfortable because those these areas that have a lot of moisture on the ground have a lot of creepy crawlies running around. I'm not really interested in sleeping in among them so yeah me either um and there's certain ways you guys that you're going to want to set your hammock up some people like to stretch those suckers so tight that when you sit in them it just wants to flip and flop and almost throw you out of it like you're riding a buck and bronco what you need to do so when you're setting up your um uh, your straps okay that go up to your tree typically if you want to if you want to take your your thumb and index finger and make an L like you would put it up to your head like a loser. Well, if you take the short part of your thumb and the long part of your index finger, that is the angle that you want your strap running at. Okay. So if you, if you strap it to the tree and your angle is sharper or less than um, the angle that produces with your, with your thumb to finger, just like that, if you made a gun, you can see that, uh, that right angle there. That is actually about the perfect um, sag. Yeah. Looks like it's probably 30 to 40 degrees or something would yep, be about that. Yeah, it's a little – it's it's not 45. It's less than that. It's yeah. somewhere between 30 and 25, something like okay. that. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. So when you're setting that up, make sure you do that. It doesn't have to be stretched super tight. And also, whenever you lay in your hammock, never lay with your feet in your head – facing or i guess how would you point that joel like you don't want to lay directly tree to tree okay you actually uh, want to turn and lay catty corner tree to tree yeah. okay yeah you, you want to slightly diagonal in your in your hammock um to, to comfort wise right yes yeah, so the, so Yep. So what it does is it keeps you from having your feet up in the air and then your head up in the air to where you're sleeping like a yeah. banana. If you slide, if you shift slightly to one side or the other and lay diagonal, all of a sudden you'll feel yourself lay down flat. And what's crazy yeah. is, is I'm a side sleeper. So I, and people are like, Oh, I don't like a, I don't like a hammock because I can't ever twist and turn or flip and flop like I like to do. Pfft, dude, I flip and flop. I lay on my side. I actually pee right from my hammock. I don't ever even get oh, out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Peeing from works great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's the yeah. cool thing is whenever – so whenever I'm in the hammock, I have a side that I – well, here's another cool thing is it's a freaking chair. You can lift your tarp up and you have somewhere to sit and you don't have to go all the way to the ground to be able to relax putting your yep. shoes on, all that stuff. Like, it's just, it benefits everybody um, once yeah, you learn it. The, the, so the sleeping the sleeping part of the hammock is the part that I have a challenge with. And there is definitely, for me, there is a sweet spot in 
having the tarp tight, I mean, the hammock tight, but not too tight. Like there's no ways you can sleep in a banana shaped hammock. Like no one's going to have a comfortable sleep in that. But if it's too tight, like you say, it doesn't like it wants to flip flop. It wants to almost throw you out of it every time you move. It just seems to be a little less stable. So you do want to find that sweet spot. And when you do something that really help, has helped me is using one of those um, camping style foam mats. When you put those inside, it gives you a little more uh, stability and more of a platform to sleep on instead of it being so like um, like being in a like suffocated in a mummy bag. You know, it just gives you a little bit more of a of a, of a flatter flattened out um, uh, sleeping area. But like Cole said too, like it's it's crucial that you you twist your keep. So if you think about the tarp being straight line from tree to tree, your body straight line. You want to kind of like if you put your straight line body on top of that straight top and then you just twist the whole thing to the left or the right so that it's slightly diagonal to the top, you'll find that if you want to sleep in a flattened out position, that's the better way to do it. However, most of the time, I'm sleeping in a little bit more of a fetal position. I'm, I'm like you. I'm a side sleeper. So hammocks for side sleepers are perfect. If you're a if you're a hammock sleeper, well, okay, maybe hammock is not the best <laughs> choice for you. That's going to be a little challenging. You might want to be on the ground. But um, there's a lot of pros, and of course, one of the biggest pros too is the is the amount, the volume, and the weight. Like to pack a tarp and a hammock, that those that combination in your pack is just about as lightweight as anything else, and really doesn't take up much space. Yeah, and that's so, the real. So I've weighed it before. So I use a um, a Big Agnes Diamond Park zero degree sleeping bag. Um, it, it can actually be transformed into a, um, into a quilt. So the whole bottom of my sleeping bag actually zips off. Now, the cool thing about this, th that sleeping bag is it's actually designed to be a hammock sleeping bag. Okay. W and what I mean by that is, well, it's really versatile in any aspect of backpacking, but this sleeping bag actually has a containment, um, deal like a bungee that holds my sleeping pad in my sleeping bag okay if that makes sense so no matter how oh. much yeah so no matter how much i twist or turn or anything like that the sleeping pad stays underneath me it's specifically designed for that and my sleeping bag doesn't have any insulation on the bottom of it isn't that crazy yeah, well, the the thing is that a lot of people don't realize that the insulation on the bottom of the sleeping bag unless you're talking about a um so we're talking about down right so unless it you're is. talking about a, a synthetic or uh the old school style ones which is uh oh what were the, the material uh, they were thick and heavy yeah those don't press as easy but with down it compresses so easy that in almost any down sleeping bag the part that's between you and the ground isn't doing anything it's useless yeah yeah doing it yeah yeah I mean, this is such a great system, man. I, I do love it. And you've got it set up really well for any type of weather. Um, and I think that that was definitely something worth mentioning. Um, the uh, Man, we're, we're covering a, a bit of ground with, with this. And I'm, I'm really hoping that everyone is uh, we're sort of on track with what everyone's looking for. I mean, we've talked a little bit about long-term shelters and how to go about thinking about them when you construct them. We've talked about, you know, tarps. And, you know, tarps are really such a big... A big help. Um, I want to just cover something quickly. I just feel compelled to mention it is if you're out in that more of a survival situation, um, things that could really help you if you don't have an actual tarp is in your survival kit, a couple of great backup options to, to building a waterproof shelter would be to carry a contractor style heavy duty garbage bag. You know, those ones that you get from, I, I, I just, in my head, I think about Husky or like um, Home Depot. They sell those big garbage bags. The ones that are thick, when I say thick, like you can't really rip them with your hands. They're, 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 they're thick. Those ones make awesome little uh, temporary uh, tarps. You can cut them up and you can make them into raincoats. You can use them to capture water. You can use them to gather insulation material. Um, you can use them to cut up and make into a roof. You can cut them up and make them into a door. I mean, there's a lot of functions that you can use those for in a survival situation, and they're very inexpensive and very lightweight. Um, 
I would almost say that they they would probably be better than um, an emergency space blanket or a mylar blanket, which is very very stereotypical um, item in a survival kit. They are not all created equal. Um, there are mylar blankets that are like just a buck or two and pack down very small size of a credit card. When you unravel them, though, you'll notice that they're very brittle. If you capture them onto any sharp point, they're going to rip like crazy. Um, however, the beautiful thing is that they reflect 90% of your body heat back at you. So if you get one that's big enough, um, you can wrap it around you in a situation where you're freezing and it could potentially save your life. Um, I've also used them, like Cole was mentioning earlier, you take a little, whatever, a pebble, an acorn, whatever you got, and you wrap it up in the corners, um, and then you can tie some rope to them, and you could actually string it up into a little lean-to style roof, and you can have your fire in front of you, and it acts as a significant reflector. So that heat that that fire produces gets reflected right back into your body. Um, so there's definitely a definitely better than nothing, but I would say if you're looking at packing something that is super lightweight and 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 just is a is a hail mary to save your life and 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 uh, hopefully stop you from dying of hypothermia, I would look at the heavy duty emergency bivy sacks. They're they're about the size, all packed up. I would say about the size, maybe a little smaller than a cell phone, and they're maybe like two or three inches in diameter and they weigh nothing they weigh nothing but sol makes it makes one that is a heavy when i say heavy duty you it's not the cheap mylar style this one can be um used without being ripped so you could roll around and in, in, on the ground in it and you would absolutely be fine but it still has those reflective properties of of really keep capturing your body heat and the bivy sack is basically if you think about a mummy sleeping bag that's what it mimics, right? You climb inside of it. Your entire body is inside of it. And that way, talking about uh, shelters, right? The biggest thing about a shelter being insulated is that we're trapping our body heat in. And that's the key with this bivy sack is it traps all of that body heat in. However, it is not breathable. So you definitely want to be very cautious of that shelter, of, of that type of, of setup is because you could sweat inside of it. And once you sweat inside of that, that moisture is not going anywhere. So if that moisture then refreezes, you're going to chill yourself down very quickly. So bivy, those those bivy sacks, um, you can get them in like Gore-Tex breathable bivy sacks. In fact, I've used one for years, just a military style Gore-Tex bivy sack. I put my sleeping bag inside of it so that if I was to lay on the floor, even if the floor is moist, I'm staying dry but it's breathable. So I'm not going to wake up all wet and, and in the morning and soggy and then have to potentially concern myself with with that that moisture refreezing. But in a situation where it's just you got to spend the night out there, it's going to be freezing cold, you don't have you're not able to make a fire, you don't have warm enough clothing, having an emergency bivy sack is I think the most effective way of using an emergency style shelter because those uh, mylar blankets, the space blankets are just really hard to, uh, to cover yourself and keep all of the air out and away from your body and to cap capture that heat. Um, you, the best way to do it, I've noticed, is by sitting in an upright position, leaning up against a tree or a rock or something, and then wrapping that blanket around you. But it's going to be such a miserable night's sleep because you're going to be so conscious about keeping that blanket in place. Mm -hmm. So I would steer, steer you in the direction of, of the bivy sack. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just a few, yeah, that's just a few other things I wanted to throw out there and add into this conversation. I feel like we've covered a lot, Cole. Yeah, man, we did. I do want to touch real quick for those of for those that are into the backpacking and, and doing that stuff, a lot of people like to use these one and two man tents. Okay. I like, I love those tents. So don't get us wrong here. They do make great shelters. However, I, what Joel's talking about with the condensation and stuff like that, I don't know how many times on these little tents I have woke up and throughout a cold night, most of the times we're backpacking and it gets into the 40s and 30s at night, right, during elk season. During deer season, it gets a little colder than that. And I've had so many situations to where I sit up in the morning and brush the edge of the freaking tent and it is covered in 
in moisture and condensation. With the yep. tarp, it, it doesn't do that because you have the airflow through there that keeps the buildup of your hot breath inside of that shelter, if that makes sense to all you guys. So we're not against those those types of shelters. We just tend – I've, I've moved away from them because of weight and they're not as simple to set up. Like I can jump in if, if I'm trying to set up my shelter, okay. And it's dumping down rain. How wet do you think that tent is going to get inside by the time you get that, that thing set up completely? Oh yeah. Yeah. And then of course, packing it all up is a mess and putting it in your pack, you know, all wet. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, it's just not really con- <clears throat> the stereotypical type of tent with like several poles and all that. Like, you know, it's not, not really conducive to, to long backcountry trips in my opinion. Mine either. Um, so yeah, I mean, outside tent, um, or like that uh, Dyneema one that you that you sent me, which is more of that TP. It all, all it uses is one pole. Yep. Okay, it's 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 the it's the combination. It's sort of like a, a middle ground, right? It's not a tent because there's no there's no floor to it. Exactly. But it's not a tarp because it's completely enclosed, and you do use a pole in the center. Now that is a fantastic option if you're looking for a tent option. That is the one to to go with because um, I would... that that's whole situation makes it really strong within for storms yeah. you know with really that thing is going to hold up yes yeah, so uh, i do love the seek outside and stuff like that but uh joel i do have another company that i'm talking with and i do want to say oh. their i do want to say their name um so you guys these this company makes some really badass shelters i am actually testing a ground cloth and a tarp and game bags from viom outdoors uh, my buddy Aaron Ooh. Smoss, he owns Viome Outdoors um, as well as Rocky Mountain uh, Hunting Calls. Um, so uh, if y'all want to see like what we're talking about, they have a great TP um, that he has just released. Um, and I'm trying to get my hands on it so that I can do a review on it. Because it is, it's a split between a tent and a, a tarp. Okay, but the cool thing is, is this isn't completely closed off all the way to the ground. You leave a little bit of breathing room on the very bottom of this teepee, and it it makes it to where it doesn't have that condensation uh, issue like uh, like some of these tents and stuff do. So, yeah, and you know, I can imagine some of the listeners are thinking to themselves, "Well, hold on, you guys say that the key to a good shelter is completely enclosing it, but now you're saying that with these tarps, like there should be a gap." Well. Yes, because tarps and any natural shelter that you build, it's automatically going to be breathable. Yes. But when you use these man-made materials, especially things like uh, polypropylene and that, they're not breathable at all. So you will have that sweat build up on the ins- the, the condensation build up on the inside. So the, if you if you're looking at a backcountry hunting or just camping hiking scenario, you really want to rely on your sleeping bag for warmth. Like you're not going to use the tarp for warmth. The tarp is there to keep you dry and out of the wind. The sleeping bag, that is what's keeping you warm. So always make sure that with your sleeping bag, you get one that's rated quite a bit below the temperatures that you think you're going to be in. I have noticed that with sleeping bags, if it says it's rated to 30 degrees, it'll keep you warm enough in 30 degrees. But is it going to keep you cozy in 30 degrees? Most of the time, not. So For me here in Oregon, where I'm going through like the coldest temperatures in winter will be like single digits. Sometimes we go into the negatives, but that's usually only for just a couple of weeks. But it's pretty normal to be in the teens, maybe 20 degrees. I'm usually using a negative 40 sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. It it doesn't matter what temperatures throw at me, I'm warm. But then once we get into anywhere summertime and then the fall and the spring, um, I'm just going with my 20 degree rated bag, 15, 15 degree rated bag. And that's going to keep me warm enough there. So rely on your sleeping bag. Yep. Yeah. People think I'm crazy that I use a down zero degree sleeping bag year round, but that's because of the sleeping bag that I chose. I can disassemble yeah. it and it's actually a quilt to where I can kick a leg or something out and, and be fine in 50 degrees. I've actually slept in it in 60 degrees and it's perfect. Yep. And I've been in Nebraska all the way down into two and three degrees with that same sleep setup. And, um, I survived the night. It wasn't a hundred percent comfortable, but it, uh, you know, it, it did its job. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we have covered a, 
a variety of things. But, you know, there's just like anything. We can dive so much deeper. I mean, you want to just talk about sleeping bags, we can continue. But yeah. there's going to be time to all these things. We're just one thing at a time. You guys stay tuned because there is so much more to come. If you like the way that these uh, these podcasts have been, when I say I'm, I'm, I'm talking primarily on this, on this part one and part two shelter, if you like the information that's coming across and how we're giving it to you, then please keep listening because we have got so much more to come um, in this style. I mean, shelter, I mean, we've covered shelter. We're going to, we've got more to cover with shelter and we'll touch on in the future, but fire making and, you know, purifying water. And we want to really delve into introductory type discussions for hunters, the hunters that people that want to get into hunting and have no idea where to start. This is our specialty. This is what we teach. And we have formulated really good ways to help people uh, to, to, to get a start and avoid making all those basic mistakes. And the list just goes on and on. So stay tuned. We really appreciate your support. Uh, we have so much more to come. Yep. You guys, we so appreciate you listening. For all y'all that stuck in this long, thank you so much. If you haven't got a chance yet, make sure you go leave that five-star review for us. It's really helping us out in, in the algorithm because we're such a new podcast, okay? It really does help. Like, I know it it's, doesn't seem a big deal to you, but – to us, it really does. And Joel, did you know that our podcast being only open for 30 days, we've we've had somewhere around 50 or 60 uh, um, reviews? Wow. That yeah. many? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I told James yeah. Nash and I told Robin about it. And Robin was like, what? How <laughs> in the world? Yeah, dude. We've had more – Thank you. Thank you. Whoever's listening, whoever's done that, I, I just for it real. really means I, I'm, I'm really feeling so grateful right now for, for that. That's incredible. That's an incredible number. Yeah, dude, yeah, that's more than I mean, that's almost two five star reviews per day, Joel, that we've been live. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Please keep it up. And for those of you who haven't done it, please it means a lot. Yep. Thank you so much, right. y'all. I'm going to end y'all with rest of your week and uh bush survival training.com learn hunt harvest.com uh cole wilkes hunter and uh joel v bushcraft on instagram you know how to find us we always open up for recommendations critique anything you want to throw at us feel free <laughs> Y'all, thank you so much for listening to episode number six of In the Bush podcast with myself, Cole, and my brother, Joel. Thank you, guys. And until next time, this is episode number six. It's a wrap. See ya.